You know, a lot of people felt this performance was going to lead to Steve McQueen winning an Oscar, although it was a great performance, nominated for a, a Golden Globe for Best uh, Drama Actor. It never came about, but it stands in the minds of a lot of people as probably his most consistent performance of the 1970s. Now, Papillon is a 73 epic historical drama prison film directed by Franklin J. Schaefer. The screenplay by a former blacklisted screenwriter Dalton Trumbo and Lorenzo Semple Jr. was based on a 69 autobiography by the French convict Henri Charrier. The film stars Steve McQueen as Charrier, uh, Papillon, and Dustin Hoffman as Louis Degas. Because it was filmed at a remote location, the film was quite expensive for the time at $12 million, but earned more than twice that in its first year of release. The film's title is French for Butterfly, referring to Chayet's tattoo and nickname. Now again, based on uh, Chayet's novel, produced by Robert Dorfman and Franklin J. Schafter, also starring Anthony Zerbe and Victor Jolie, cinematography by Fred J. Conkamp, edited by Robert Swink, Music by the great uh, Jerry Goldsmith. Production companies were Le Femme Corona and General Productions Company. Distributed by Allied Artists in the States and Canada. Columbia Internationally. Release date uh, was December 16, 73. At 150 minutes. Uh, released in three languages. English, French and Spanish. And did qualify as a U.S. Uh, France uh, co-production. Now. Uh, Henri Chayet is a safe cracker nicknamed Papillon because of the butterfly tattoo in his chest. In France, he's wrongly convicted of murdering a pimp in 33 and sentenced to life in prison within the penal system in French Guiana. En route, he meets a fellow convict, Louis Degas, played by Dustin Hoffman against type, an infamous forger and embezzler who is convicted, convinced that his wife will secure his release. Papillon offers to protect Degas if he will fund the former's escape once they reach Guiana. During the horrors of life in a jungle labor camp, the two eventually became friends. Now, one day, Papillon defends Degas from a sadistic guard, escapes in the jungle, but is captured and sentenced to two more years in solitary confinement. In gratitude, Degas has extra food smuggled to Papillon. When the smuggling is discovered, the warden screens Papillon's cell in darkness for six months and halves his rations, believing that it was forced him to really, uh, reveal his benefactor. Half insane, reduced feet, and insects are survive. Papillon refused to give up Degas' name. He's eventually released and sent to the infirmary in Saint Laurent de Maroni to recover. Now Papillon sees Degas again and asks him to arrange for another escape attempt. Degas helps him meet an inmate doctor who offers to secure him a boat on the outside with the help of a man named Pascal. Fellow prisoner Clouseau, played by Woodrow Parfait, and a gay orderly named André Matarette, played by Robert Demon, joined the escape lot. Now, during the attempt, Clouseau, uh, Clouseau is knocked unconscious by a guard. The gods forced to subdue the guard, who luckily joins Papillon and Matarette, climbing the walls to the outside. The god unfortunately fractures his ankle in the fall. The trio meet Pascal and he escape into the night in the jungle the next day. Pascal delivers the prisoners to their boat, but after he leaves, the convicts discover that it is a fake. The encounter a local trapper, played by John Quaid, who has killed the bounty hunters that were waiting for them. He guides the three to a nearby leper colony, uh, where they obtain supplies and a seaworthy uh, boat. Now, how it is basically set up as the plot develops, it's sort of like if you would take a Humphrey Bogart or a John Wayne style of uh, plot device and put it in a modern day. Uh, if this was done in black and white, it wouldn't be very effective, but the cinematography, again, is uh, quite strong. Now, the trio of eventually uh, land in Honduras and are accosted by a group of soldiers who open fire and wound Matarette. He is captured along with Degas, while Papillon is forced to flee. Papillon evades the soldiers and lives for a long period with a native tribe. He awakens one morning to find him gone, leaving him with a small stack of pearls. Papillon plays a nun to take pays the nun to take him uh, to her convent when he asks the mother superior for refuge, but she intends uh, in, instead turns him over to the authorities. Very effective scene. Now, Papillon is brought back to French Guiana and sentenced to another five years of solitary confinement. He emerges a graying old man along with Matarette, who he sees just before the latter dies. Papillon is then moved to a remote devil's island where he reunites with Degas, who has long given up all hope of being released. Now, as it happens right now, uh, from a high cliff, 
Papio observes a small cove where he discovers that the waves are powerful enough to carry a man out to sea and the nearby mainland. Papio urges they got to join him in another escape and the men to make two floats out of a bag of coconuts. As he stands on the cliffside, Degas decides not to escape and begs Papio not to enter. Papio embraces Degas a final time and then leaps from the cliff. Grasping his float, he is successfully carried out to sea. A narrator then states that Papio made it to freedom and lived the rest of his life as a free man while the prison was eventually closed. Now, very strong visuals in this movie, especially where he's running through the jungle in a, in a slow uh, kind of burn, which was used in the, the preview. And like I said, very, very effective cinematography. Uh, really stands out as some of the most underrated of the 1970s. Now, after the publication of Pep- Pepio in 69, the bidding war started between AFCO Embassy Pictures, Continental Distributing, MGM, and numerous French film companies for the film rights. Continental Distributing won the rights for a half a million dollars, with the intent to get this to hire Roman Polanski as director and Warren Beatty as lead actor, but the studio's funding fell through. It sold the rights to producer Robert Dorfman, who initially intended to hire Terrence Young as director and the great Charles Bronson as star before turning uh, over to Schaefer and McQueen. The film's first screenplay by William Goldman, which was more faithful to the book than the final film, was rewritten by Lorenzo Semple Jr. to expand the role of Louis Degas in order to convince Dustin Hoffman to join the cast and eliminate the depictions of homosexuality among the prisoners. After Hoffman's casting, Dalton Trouble uh, further rewrote the screenplay. Now, Papio was filmed at various locations in Spain and Jamaica, with the cave scenes filmed beneath what is now the Extabi Hotel on the cliffs of Negrel. The town scenes at the beginning of the film were shot, shot at Honorabi in Spain. The saint laurent de Moroni penal colony scenes were actually filmed in Falmouth, Jamaica, and the swamp scenes were shot near Ferris Cross. Interior scenes were shot in Mantigo Bay, with other scenes filmed in Kingston, Ocho Rios, and Savannah La Mar. Most of the French prisoners of the island were portrayed by German Jamaican extras. Steve McQueen's famous cliff jumping scene near the end of the film took place from the cliffs in Maui. McQueen insisted on performing the cliff jumping stunt himself. He later said that was one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. Now, McKean, McQueen got his normal rate, $2 million, along with the contractual stipulation they received first billing over Dustin Hoffman. In addition, author Henry Chalier himself acted as consultant on location, apprising the filmmakers of the things he encountered during his years of imprisonment. Now, the prison of saint laurent de Moroni, where Henry Chalier was held, and where most of the action takes place, was faithfully recreated using the original blueprints. Footage of the historic, historic prison in French Guiana plays under the end credits, which are shown to be abandoned and covered in jungle growth. Now, the score to Papillon was composed and directed by Jerry Goldsmith, recorded in Rome, Italy, at the Orthonic Recording Studio by the Union Musicita Roma Orchestra. The film marked Goldsmith's fourth of Sublin Caliber collaborations with director Schaefer, following his Academy Award nominated scores to Planet of the Apes and Patton. Both the director and composer shared the belief that film music should be used economically, as he wanted the music as commentary only in sequences, where he can emphasize the psychological aspects of the film. In Papillon, the film is two and a half hours long, but has only 40 minutes with music. Now, Goldsmith's compositions, characterized by a kind of a romantic symphonic style, uh, Safu's with a meter exotic timber using instruments from Caribbean folk music, are distributed mainly in the second half of the film. He generally accompanies scenes outside the prison during the various escape attempts by the protagonist. He uses a delicate and melodic approach, dominated by a very catchy theme expressed as a waltz, which was often played by an accordion. The in- this instrument was associated with the French origin of the protagonist. The theme became famous with the popularity of the film, there was released in many performance variations by different uh, record uh, companies. Now, the score is partially produced on vinyl in 73 and uh, reissued over the years. In the 21st century, an edition was produced on CD by Universal Records France. For the first time, this has a complete version of music for the film and also five minutes of previously unreleased tracks. The DVD version of the English language version of the film includes an option to listen to Goldsmith's music as an isolated audio track. Now, Goldsmith had his sixth Academy Award nomination for Best Original Score for the Soundtrack. as one of the American Film Institute's 250 nominated soundtracks by the, for the 20, top 25 American film scores. 
The film, again, was a tremendous commercial success. It grossed $3.126 million in its opening week. Its rentals in the United States and Canada was 21.3. <clears throat> of course, did quite well in TV and the repeat airings. Now, Roger Deaver reviews on the film's original release was two out of four stars. He said that the main flaw was a failure to gain audience interest in McQueen's and Hoffman's characters. You know, something has gone wrong when you want the hero to escape simply so that the movie can be over. Vincent Canby of New York Times called the film a big, brave, stout-hearted, sometimes romantic, sometimes silly melodrama, with the kind of visual sweep you don't often find in movies anymore. Arthur D. Murphy of Variety wrote, For 150 uninterrupted minutes, the mood is one of despair, brutality, and little hope. On a pro level, the Allied Artist release is expert in all creative and technical areas. On an audience level, it's a relentless downer. Now, Gene Siskel gave the film two and a half stars out of four and called it just plain boring. Kevin Thomas of the LA Times wrote, Papillon is an eloquent tribute to the indomitability of the human spirit and a powerful indictment of those institutions dedicated only to breaking it. As such, it's lots easier to admire than enjoy. The Gary Arnold of the Washington Post called it a keen disappointment. The slumbering vehicle directed by Franklin J. Schaefer leaves McQueen and Hoffman stranded on the screen, while opportunities for vivid filmmaking and sympathetic characterizations are bungled at every turn. Now, Richard Combs of the Monthly Film Bolton wrote that what is missing is any of the book's uh, anger at the outrageous hypocrisy, injustice, and inhumanity of the system, and any of the passion which feeds Papillon's compulsion to escape. Now, Quentin Tarantino called it a pretty iconic film for boys my age who saw it when it came out. The film is very involving. It contains maybe McQueen's finest series acting moment on film, but he sticks his head over the solitary confinement door. Is not only unrecognizable, but completely deranged. Very, very heavy scene. And it kind of mimicked in uh, what in Apocalypse Now by some of the characters, the same degradation of spirit. Now, in the film, uh, contains one of the most powerful time cuts I've ever seen in a motion picture. The film's also a little bit pretentious, self consciously arty, unrelentingly grim, extremely grueling, and except for Dustin Hoffman keeping a bankroll and the extra pair of spectacles up his ass completely devoid of any entertainment uh, value. Now, Papillon holds a 72% rating on Rotten Tomatoes based on 32 reviews. Again, uh, nominated for two Oscars, Best Music and Best Score, and a Golden Globe again for Best Motion Picture Actor uh, Drama for McQueen. Don't know why in the name of God he was not nominated for an Oscar. He must have pissed so many people, so many people off. Now, the song Devil's Island by the American heavy metal band Megadeth written by lead singer Dave Mustaine, was inspired by this film and appeared in the band's 86 album, Peace Sells, But Who's Buying? The, hum, the song Human Insecticide by the Canadian thrash metal band Annihilator from the 89 album Alice in Hell was inspired by the movie. The editor songs Papillon from their 2009 album In This Light and On This Evening opens with the line Make Our Escape, You're My Own Papillon. Now Mark uh, Kol- Kolzig and Desert Shore recorded a song called Hey You Bastards, I'm Still Here, named after Papio's last quote from the film, spoken in a voiceover just before the closing credits start. Now, a parody of Papio, Fafalon was a 74 Italian comedy film directed by Ricardo Pazaglia. Now, another film based on the autobiographies of Chaglia in the 73 film, also called Papillon, was released in 2017, directed by Danish director Michael Noor. Charlie uh, Hunnam, played the lead role of Henry Chadier, while Rami Malek played Louis Degas. The film premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in September of uh, 2017. Now, although uh, it got some uh, critical uh, play, uh, play, only made $10 million at the, uh, the box office, so uh, and uh, only had uh, 52% on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Worldwide gross was only a little bit over $4 million. Done, done before, as we say. So, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Queen in the 1970s, you know, by the late end of the decade, he was pretty well sick. He did Tiring Inferno right after. But this is a, is a rough watch, and it's a man's movie, and I, if, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think there's any female characters of note in it, so it really is a man's movie. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what the Queen podcast, give us a like, comment, subscribe, or share.